One of the things that makes Ephesians 4 such a helpful chapter for us today is the fact that it just really lays out a simple biblical vision of what it means to be the church. And so a number of months back when we as a church, when we were prayerfully considering the core values that we wanted to identify, the biblical values that would kind of form the, the, the heart of what we wanted to be as a church, it was only natural to turn to Ephesians 4. And it's a chapter in which uh, Paul is, is writing to a group of, of new Christians. And you get a sense of that because in the first three chapters, he's, he's basically laying out a, a theological framework. He's laying out kind of the basics of the Christian faith for them. But the interesting thing is that when he turns to chapter 4, it becomes clear that he does not want their faith to remain basic. Instead, the prominent theme of chapter 4 is, chapter four is, is, is being grown and, and, and maturing and being built up and equipping the body. It's a chapter that's all about striving for maturity. Paul says, if we're in verse 14, Paul says, you know, we don't want to be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. We don't want to remain immature, but instead we, 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 we desire to grow strong and to become healthy and to become mature. And that really is our prayer, that is our, our, our passion as a church, is that, is that we would become strong and healthy and mature. And we tried to articulate that in, in our mission plan when we adopted a statement about maturity. And you'll see it on some of the posters. I wanted to read it with you this morning. We said this, we said, Blessing strives to foster a culture of biblical maturity by discipling and instructing people with the truth of Scripture so that the love of Jesus Christ is exemplified and reflected in families, marriages, and workplaces. This is a statement which we essentially drew directly out of Ephesians, and particularly out of Ephesians 4, verse 15. And Ephesians 4, verse 15 is going to be the text that we're going to look at today. And it's a text, again, that's just driving how to grow and to become strong and how to become solid as a church. And I want to look at just three things from that chapter today. Three things, and they are basically this, truth, love, and growth. Three things that need to be part of the Christian community. The first is this, truth. If we want to foster a culture of biblical maturity, then we must be grounded in the truth. We must be grounded in the truth. You notice that verse 15 starts with that word instead. Instead, and so Paul is he's making a comparison here. He's basically saying, you know, don't, don't be this, but instead be that. And as I mentioned earlier, what he's driving at is he's saying, well, don't remain, don't remain an immature church, but instead grow up, grow up, become a mature church. That's, that's the, the, the pattern that he wants them to follow. But the first thing that he says, the first thing that he wants them to do is he says, I want you to speak the truth. And the word that he uses for speaking is actually not the, the, the typical word that's used for speaking. It's a word that has a, a sense that's more than just speaking. It's a, a word that also describes being truthful. Someone who, who, who has truth as kind of the very fiber of, of their being. Someone you could say who is anchored in the truth of the Word of God. Someone who adheres and someone who holds tight to the truth of the Word of God. I want you to be those kind of people, says Paul. And I think we need to take notice of that also as a church because even in the Christian culture it seems that that those kind of people are becoming more and more rare. I think I shared with you a, a study. I shared these statistics at Blessings Youth a few weeks ago. But you have this study. It's only a couple of years old in the U.S. where, where regular churchgoers are surveyed. And of those surveyed, 45% said that they open their Bible more than once a week. 40% said that they open their Bibles once or twice a month. And a full 15% said 
said that they never opened their Bible. These are people who identify as regular churchgoers. And Paul is saying you, you, you need to be built on the Word of God. I want to share with you just a quote from John Piper, which I think highlights the, 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 the seriousness of what this issue causes. He says, not to care about truth is not to care about God. To love God passionately is to love truth passionately. Being God-centered in life means being truth-driven in ministry. What is not true is not of God. Indifference to truth is indifference to the will of God. If we want to be a healthy church, then we must, must, must build on the truth of the Word of God. The same way that if you want to be a healthy Christian, you must build upon the truth of the Word of God. And, and this is this is exactly the template that Jesus lays down when he explains discipleship. In, in John chapter 17, you have this prayer of Jesus where Jesus, he, he knows that he's not going to be with the disciples for that much longer. He knows that he's going back to the Father. And so he's praying for his disciples because he knows that they're going to be alone. He knows that they're going to face attacks. They're going to face difficulty. And so he's praying for them, and he says this. He says, Father, sanctify them, grow them, mold them, lead them in your truth. And then he says this. He says, your word is truth. You know, you might ask this morning, why does the truth of the word of God matter so much? Well, it's because the Word of God is what the Spirit of God uses to grow strong, stable, healthy Christians who are committed in their faith. The Word of God is what the Spirit of God uses to prepare us also when we, when we face the attacks of the devil. One of the things that you notice when you look at the life of Jesus in Matthew 4 is that he has this encounter where he's tempted by the devil. And if you're familiar with the story, you know that Jesus is led into the wilderness and, and he's there for 40 days. He's tired, he's fatigued. And exactly then, the devil comes to tempt him. And the devil has all these great offers. Well, I can do this for you. I can do that for you. You could have all of this if you just... And each time that Jesus refutes the devil, he turns to the word of God. And if Jesus feels that it's important to refute the attacks of the devil with the truth of the word of God, then I think we could say that it's important for us to value the truth of the word of God as well. And you know, as we are kind of taking part of this recommit sermon series, one of the things I want you to just ask yourself is this. Are you able to defend yourself in the truth of the Word of God? If someone comes to you and asks you to simply explain what you believe and why you believe it, are you able to provide a, a biblical explanation? Can you open up the Word of God and and point to some of the key passages that explain who Jesus is and what he's done, passages about sin and salvation. Are you able to lead others in the truth of the Word of God? Are you able to disciple others? And if you're not, well, then you need to continue to grow the same way we all need to continue to grow. We must be a church that is grounded in the truth. But a second thing we need is we must be a church that is governed by love. We must be a church that's governed by love. The end goal for Paul when he's speaking to this group of Christians is not just that they would have truth, but that they would speak the truth in love. And Paul goes even farther in 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says this, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, 
I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, then I am nothing. If we as a church of Jesus Christ do not reflect the love of Jesus Christ, the implication is that we are nothing. You know, we need to be burdened with a heart for those who are hurting. The Word of God is not meant to be a theological club that beats people into submission. But God gives us His Word more like a shepherd's staff that, that can lovingly guide and correct and steer people to a place where they can have growth, a place where they can thrive. The way to help those who are wayward, those who are struggling, those who are off the track, those who are burdened and hurting and struggling, is, is not to beat them in the right direction, but it is to encourage, to lovingly guide them in the truth. We have a lot of people in this church And we have a lot of people who are hurting. We have people who struggle in ways that you could not imagine. We have people who are lonely. We have people in this church who spend every night of the week alone. Do we have a heart for those who are hurting? Because when they are hurting and struggling and wayward, that's exactly when they are vulnerable. That's exactly when the devil is going to come in and he's going to attack and he's going to clamp onto their faith and cast doubt and fear and try to drive away. The devil is described in First Peter as a roaring lion who is looking for someone to devour. Who do you think are easiest to devour? It's the ones who are vulnerable. The lion is always looking for an easy kill. I want to share just a picture with you this morning. I want to maybe drive this point home a little bit. This here is a, a picture of a young African buffalo. It was the best that I could find. A nice young baby buffalo, but here's the thing. Lions like to eat young baby buffaloes. And why do you think that they choose the young buffalo? Well, it's exactly because it's vulnerable. It's exactly because it, 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 it's not able to recognize danger. The young buffalo does not have a full sense of reality. It does not have an, an understanding of the world in which it lives and, and the implications of its decisions. And it also has an incredible ability to be distracted. Right? It's just wandering around. It sees a little bit of grass here. It's like, oh, cool, grass. Right? It sees a little grass over there. Oh, grass. And soon it, it, it's wandered from the herd, totally oblivious to the danger that it's in. Well, since this is a PG program, I'm not going to show you the next pictures, but... Needless to say, it doesn't go well for the little buffalo. So you ask yourself, well, how does a buffalo survive in, in a world where there is constant, constant danger of attack? Well, there's only one way. Let me share with you just another picture. You know, the young buffalo is not able to detect danger. But the mature buffaloes are. And it's a fascinating thing because what you discover is, is that when they sense danger, they will sound the alarm and they will run and they will surround the buffalo and they will, they will face the attack. And they will stand there and they will, they will stand in the gap just surrounding and protecting the young and the vulnerable. 
Well, I don't want to use the analogy that the church is a herd. I don't know if that's right. But I think there's something to be said for the fact that the church is a family. And we don't get to choose our family. It's made up of the young and the old. It's made up of those who are going through joy. It's made up of, of those who are going through challenges. Those who have burdens, those who have blessings. And we're called to love our family. And we're called specifically to rally around our family. You know, you need both things. You need godly, mature leaders. Those who are able to recognize danger and who are able to step out and, and to speak the truth. But you also need the younger ones. The ones who are going to grow up and one day take the place of the older ones. It's a continual cycle of growth, of speaking the truth and love. That, that's the model of discipleship that we need to have. But the other thing is that it involves self-sacrifice. Loving people the way that Christ does involves sacrifice. And the older buffalo doesn't say to the younger buffalo, well, that's a really unfortunate situation that you got yourself in. Good luck. No, they, they naturally, they leave whatever they're doing and they wrap around, they rally around. That's the way the Christian church works. We love people, we wrap around people, and we guide them ultimately in the truth because they are family. I want to ask you this morning, are you committed to the family? Are you committed to the family? You know, I just said there's a lot of hurting, broken people in this church. When you think practically of this weekend, we have Thanksgiving, it's a great time. We get together with family, friends, we have dinner. Have you given any thought to those who might be alone? Any thought to those who have no place to go? We're regularly praying for people who are hurting, who have chronic pain, chronic struggles. Are you visiting? Are you taking time out of your day to love them? Now maybe you say, well, I don't know them. Well, here, get to know them. Get to know them. We have all these different ways in which we can be involved, in which we can serve. Are you building up the body of Christ? One of the great, great lies that seems to have, have, have slipped into Christianity is this idea that everything happens at the top. People need to be visited, pastor will do it. People need some encouragement, elders, deacons will do it. I love verse 11 of this passage which says, yeah, you give pastors and you give teachers, but why to equip the people for works of service? That's how it works in a family. So we need to speak the truth in love. Let me close with this. We need to be growing in Christ. I would say one of the goals of this church is to see people grow to be more and more like Jesus. That's what makes this verse in particular, 15, so valuable. Speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. We don't want people to remain spiritual infants but we want them to grow and look more and more like Christ. Sometimes I think we, we have the temptation as Christians to think that we've arrived. Right? I'm a Christian, I've arrived. But you never see that language in the Bible. You constantly see the language of, of, of pursuing and, and of growing and of training in righteousness and of, of beating my body, that the constant struggle of following Christ and wanting to be more and more like Christ. The beautiful thing, actually, about the Christian life is that on this side of eternity, we never arrive. I came across a song this past week, and I just loved the lyrics. I wanted to share it with you. It's called, God's Not Finished With Me Yet. And the words go like this, Now I'm not what I used to be, 
there's still work to do in me. God's not finished with me yet. He's working on my feet so they will walk straight. He's working on my heart to keep it pure. He's holding my hand so he can lead me and teach me to endure. When the going gets tough, I get frustrated and I start to forget that God's not finished with me yet. One day I thought I had arrived, so the good Lord brought me down to size. He said, I'm not finished with you yet. Now I'm on the potter's wheel. He's molding me to fit his will. God's not finished with me yet. I wonder where God has you this morning. Does he have you on the potter's wheel? If you look at your life three months ago, six months ago, a year ago, five years ago, you know, what are the ways in which God has shaped you and, and changed you and molded you? What are the sins that he's exposed in your life that need to go? What are the ways in which he's, he's changed you more and more? We never arrive, but we are always a work in progress. And if you look, maybe you're looking at your life and you're saying, I, I actually think I might be exactly the same as I was five years ago. Then one of the things that you can do is you, you can plug yourself into the Christian community, surround yourself with, with godly, mature Christian people who surround you and love you and encourage you. Get plugged into your small group. Be a part of it. Be encouraged. Be loved. Be willing to listen. And as God shapes and matures you as individuals, God will also shape and mature the church. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, our desire as a church is to grow and to be strong in our faith. Lord, we want more and more to reflect the love of Jesus Christ. Our desire to protect others and to love others and to encourage others stems directly from the fact that you have loved and protected us. The truth is that all of us, at one time, we were vulnerable and we were walking our own way and we were doing our own thing. And yet, instead of allowing us to be destroyed, we had Jesus Christ, your son, who stepped in and defended us from attack, who gave his life for our life. And Father, that love is what drives us. That love that says even the hurting and the broken and the wayward can be saved. And they can be changed and they can be transformed more and more. And so we pray that you would give us a heart for those here who need to be loved those who are lonely, those who struggle, those who have pain. Lord, help us to be sacrificial. Help us not to think of loving people as an inconvenience, but help us to recognize that it is one of the great joys of following Christ. And Lord, as we grow and as we mature, would you help us to realize that you're not done with us, but that you're constantly shaping us and molding us more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen.